All right, let's get going. So today we're going to take a little bit of a break from query processing and start talking about how data is actually represented in a way that we can query efficiently. Uh, we're going to talk about what's called physical layout uh, or physical organization. The, uh, the way that you basically put, the way that you store data uh, so that you can recover it efficiently. And physical layout is really uh, driven by a couple of different factors, uh, not the least of which is the memory hierarchy. Um, the idea of a physical layout, of a good physical layout, is one that takes advantage of every layer uh, in the hierarchy that you can. Um, towards uh, one end of the spec, uh, the, the memory hierarchy is a spectrum. Uh, towards one end, you have really small, rep uh, small data, which is really, really fast, the level, uh, the caches. And then towards the, e the other end of the spectrum, you have basically lots of storage uh, that tends to be very slow. And physical layout, one of the, the, the goals is to basically design the data in such a way that you're accessing as small a chunk of uh, the data at any given point in time. So when thinking about storage, there's uh, a bunch of different questions that we need to start uh, thinking of. Um, how do we uh, take advantage of the memory hierarchy? How do we keep the, the data that we're working with at any given point in time small? Um, how can we design the, and one way to do that, excuse me, is to design a layout that works with the data access patterns that you're expecting to see. Um, so how can you design a physical layout that allows us to get to the, the data we're looking for as quickly uh, as possible? Now once we have this, how do we organize the data in such a way that we can minimize the cost that it takes to access it? And how do we minimize the, the cost of actually storing it? Because uh, disk may be cheap, but it's still a cost. Now, in a, in a typical database, there are two components that you're likely to see. One called a buffer manager that addresses the first two questions. Uh, in other words, how do you keep data in memory efficiently? And one called the file manager that addresses the actual representation of the data on disk. Okay, so this is the high level picture. Let's zoom in a little. Um, when you organize the data, there's three really basic high-level strategies for how to organize your data. And the first of these is to simply not try to organize it. Um, take your records, store them in whatever order they happen to fall in, just have this big long file of records. And this is typically referred to as a heap, not to be confused with a heap data structure. Now, a second strategy would be to start clustering your data, organizing it uh, in, let's say, a sorted list, or by bucketing it, or by basically taking some effort to lay the data out so that it's organized according to some attributes in the data, either sorted, excuse me, or grouped. And the third organizational tactic, let's call it, is to, to build a secondary structure that organizes the data for you. So this is kind of like having your data in a sorted list, but an index is uh, a separate data structure, a separate uh, file that tells you where the data that you're looking for is. So, all right, these are three general tactics. Why would we want to use one of these or the other? Let's say a uh, heap. Why would we want to use a heap? Yeah. Okay, so if the data is uh, being written to more frequently or much more frequently than it's being read from, then a heap is going to be a good way to store the data because that uh, we don't have to put any effort into organizing it. Our reads are going to be really slow, but the writes are going to be really fast. Okay, why wouldn't we want to use it? 
Yeah, so the opposite holds for reading. Um, reads are going to be really slow. So this is kind of a trade-off between heaps and, uh, and sorted or clustered uh, data layouts. Why would we want to use an index? If you want very fast reads, so why couldn't I just uh, why couldn't I just use a sorted layout? So, in, if I have a sorted a sorted file, I would need to do a linear scan through it even to find a single record. What makes you say that? If I have a record stored every 100 bytes, um, and I know I have 100 records, what's stopping me from just jumping to record, fi uh, record 50? and doing a binary search from there. So the, the response is because you still need to read all of the, the data in the file. And that's typically, uh, well, actually I think I may have cut those slides, but um, so most file system most file systems support an operation called seek, which is jump to the following byte in a file. And if I know exactly which byte uh, corresponds to, record, uh, to the middle record, there's nothing stopping me from just jumping to that particular byte in the file. It may not be as efficient, uh, so just to be clear, a seek is an expensive operation, but it's typically going to be less expensive than scanning over all of those records far less expensive, typically. So again, why would we want to store indexes? Uh, yeah? OK, so OK, so the, uh, could I phrase that as the index is smaller and therefore easier to maintain than a full sorted list? Because I'm not storing all of the data, the, uh, I can keep an index organized more efficiently, more quickly than I'd be able to keep the entire data set organized. And this provides a trade-off between keeping uh, all of the data organized and keeping all of the data unorganized. Yeah. Right, so uh, if I want to sort a big file, that's going to be a really expensive process. And every, every time I want to, let's say, insert something into that file, again, it becomes really, really expensive. So keeping a sorted array organized is going to be much more difficult than keeping a much smaller index organized, presumably, unless the data is, each record is, is really, really small. Um, any other thought? So. That's immediately one really big advantage. Um, are there any other advantages to keeping an index? Yeah. Ah, okay. So how are we sorting the array? Why would that, uh, why would that make uh, an index useful? Or how, how would that uh, impact the choice to do an index? Exactly. So we can only, uh, let me rephrase that slightly. Um, we can only have one sort order. I might sort on multiple attributes, but um, I can only, uh, I could sort on multiple attributes, but I'd have to give those attributes a priority order. So I could sort on full name rather than just first name or last name, but one of those two would have to be more important. I'd have to sort first on, fir uh, on last name and then 
sort within each, uh, within each last name based on first name or the other way around. So I, I, I'm not going to use the phrase sort on one attribute, but you can only define one sort order. And if I want to look things up by both first name and last name, then it's going to be much more efficient if I have well, I'm not going to be able to take advantage of an index that's sorted on last name uh, if I want to do lookups based on first name. So an index gives me a, a way of storing multiple sort orders, or a second, or third, or fourth, or fifth sort order. Yeah? I don't understand uh, how we get to uh, that. I mean, you have to have a data to have an index, right? So the, the question is, how does an index work? Um, an index... An index is built with respect to either a heap or a clustered data set. And the idea of an index is that it has pointers. So, uh, for example, an index could say uh, everyone with the first name Oliver starts at uh, the, this particular byte in the sorted file. Or uh, there are three people with the first name Oliver and they exist at bytes uh, 5,000, 6,000, and 8,000 in this heap file. So it basically stores pointers into uh, an actual data file. Now, granted, that's not going to be quite as efficient as just going, doing a binary search and finding the, the uh, point in the file where the record I'm looking for is stored, but it's going to be much more efficient than doing a full scan over the entire table, particularly if the index is on a very selective attribute or uh, uh, an attribute with lots of, of values. Does that address your question? So the, typically, uh, if you are indexing the whole table, basically you are indexing everything in the table, then that's going to be, it all, it all depends on how big your index is. If your index is too big, then I think sorting itself will be worse because indexing everything in the table. Um, so the, the comment is, how much of the data are you indexing? And if you're indexing a very large amount of the data, then um, sorting may be more efficient. And that's a good observation. So typically, what are you storing in an index? Um, you're storing the key, or each of the keys that you're, you're indexing on, first name in the example I gave, and a set of pointers, so one integer. Now, if you're talking about a relation with maybe three attributes, uh, uh, two strings and, a, and an integer, then the difference between the size of the index and the size of the base data is fairly small. On the other hand, if you're talking about uh, a, an, a relation with 10 attributes, half of which are strings, and this is a fairly, fairly common thing in the TPCH data set that, uh, that some of the Project One queries are using. Um, there's like between 10 and 20 attributes for most of the, the relations, and some of the, uh, at least half of them are strings. Strings are really, really big. So by indexing on, um, <coughs> by building an index which just is going to have one attribute and an integer, that's going to be much narrower probably much smaller. And in fact, frequently indexes fit in memory. So you're right in that if the relation itself is quite narrow, an index isn't going to buy you a lot. However, there are, there's still the other advantage. Uh, if I have first name, last name, ID, then I can only sort on first name and then last name or last name and then first name. And if I want to do lookups on both first name and last name, then I have to have a separate... This isn't a matter of, of uh, m uh, ma maintaining the structure efficiently. It's simply if I want to be able to efficiently look up on first name and last name, I essentially have to have two copies of the entire data. One sorted on first name, one sorted on last name. But instead of keeping two copies of the full data, I can just have pointers back into the original, uh, the original table that stores the, the full data set. And that is still going to be smaller. Does that address your concern? OK, any other questions? All right. 
So I can, the, the question is, uh, do you have one index per attribute? There's one, you, yeah, so, so typically, that, 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 uh, that's actually a great uh, question. Um, so having, okay, so the, the, the question is really based, or the, the, the answer to that is based on what kind of queries you're going to be answering. So you'll note, I, the way I phrased my response earlier was, if you're going to be looking up both on first name and last name, then you're going to want to have uh, a sorted uh, layout for one of those and an index for the other. And that if is the important part. Uh, because if I don't care about looking up people's first name, or I don't care about looking up people's last name, then I can get away with just a sorted list. I'm only looking for, one of the, uh, for a sort order over one of the attributes. Um, so typically the way this is done is that in your t create table statements, there's going to be an explicit list of all of the indexes that you want to build up because the database doesn't necessarily know what kind of uh, queries you're going to be posing over the data. Yeah. If you don't know what indexes to create, you don't know what indexes to create. Um, there is a huge body of research. People have been trying and, and succeeding to various degrees uh, over the past 30, 40 years um, to come up with strategies for uh, selecting the right set of indexes uh, to, to handle a given workload. Um, it's still more of an art than it is a science. Uh, but you pick the right, uh, basically, th this, is, this is typically punted to, uh, to some human basically thinking, who, who sits down, looks at a schema, looks at the kind of quest questions that people are going to ask about that schema, thinks really, really hard, and then says, okay, I need these three indexes. Um, and there's a whole bunch of benchmark, like Oracle has uh, this huge infrastructure uh, sitting next to its database that basically keeps track of all the queries that get run on it, how long every part of every query takes, and then can say, okay, this query took this long. If you want it to take this long, um, you can try using this index and maybe, uh, maybe that'll, that'll help. But it's still very much an art rather than a science. So we're not gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about cost estimation probably in, in a couple of lectures. Uh, today we're mostly gonna focus on just implementing the indexes in the first place. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, okay. So a little bit of terminology. Uh, a little bit of terminology just so we can, we're on the same page. Um, in a database, or in a file system, there are, or in a database sitting on a file system, we can talk about files as kind of the, the base abstraction, excuse me, the base abstraction for storing data. And this is more of an operating system abstraction than, a, than one specific to databases, uh, but a file typically consists of a set of pages. And a page is typically what we think of as an atomic uh, chunk of data that you can load into memory in one go. So a file is basically, you can think of a file as a big list of pages. And anytime we want to uh, load the file into memory, we don't load the entire file into memory or we don't scan through the file uh, bit by bit, we load one page of data into memory at a time. 
and then a page typically sits on top, uh, a page typically has uh, a bunch of records in it. Did I cut that out? No, I didn't. Good. Um, OK, so we're going to talk about a couple of different components in the system. Uh, but first, I want to kind of motivate why this view exists. Now, at this point, you're probably already starting to work on, um, well, hopefully you've already done more than start working on project one. Uh, but you can think of the, th this is kind of a high level view of what the select operators get next predicate should be doing. Um, it's got some predicate, it's got some source, and it's going to loop over all of the, the tuples in the source and produce uh, some, it's going to emit some tuples. Now, there are two bottlenecks that appear here because the source, depending on where the source stores its output, um, is going to potentially have a high latency for reading individual tuples. Similarly, the output, when we do an output, we don't want every single individual output to produce, to go to disk, because the latency of that output is going to be fairly high. So. I could potentially rewrite this operator to explicitly account for uh, to ex explicitly account for some amount of buffering. And in fact, I think uh, a couple of lectures ago, someone uh, that was that was pointed out that we actually do want to buffer some tuples. Now, this kind of process works well. But I have to design all of my operators with this kind of buffering in mind. And because this uh, process of, uh, of buffering appears so frequently throughout uh, everything that a, a database does, uh, it makes sense to start generalizing and standardizing the way that this buffering happens. So in a typical database engine, there's going to be a component uh, called the buffer manager that sits there and uh, has some ability to l load things into memory and flush things back to disk. And this buffer manager basically has the ability to allocate some memory that's back to disk, uh, access data that is uh, on this page uh, that is on these, these chunks of memory, and then flush them back to disk. And typically what this looks like is this one big array of pages uh, that are either live or not. A little bit more terminology here for you. Uh, the buffer manager basically has these kind of open blocks that it loads pages into, and those open blocks are called frames. So anytime that some operator or some component in the system is looking for uh, data that's on disk, it will call into the buffer manager and say, OK, I'm interested in this block of, of uh, data. And then the buffer manager is going to uh, keep, make sure that that, uh, that chunk of memory, that chunk of data, stays in memory. Uh, and this, is, this goes by many different names. Uh, the one that you'll probably hear mostly in databases is called pinning, although this is also, uh, you might hear the term reference counting. Right. So an operator that's looking to access chunks of data on disk is basically going to go to the buffer pool, uh, the buffer manager, and say, I want this chunk of data, or I want these chunks of data, and it's going to pin those into memory. Uh, the other thing that the buffer manager needs to be able to do is be aware of when the data changes. So uh, any of the, the data that's sitting in the buffer manager's frames uh, if any of it changes, those changes need to be persisted back to disk. We'll get, into, uh, we'll get into modifications later on in the term, but essentially the, the buffer manager needs to also be responsible for flushing that data back to disk. Okay. Do a quick example. Um, let's say I'm just looking for a... Uh, 
really simple query, give me all of the data for officers where the officer's ship is in this chunk. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. The simple way would be to simply build a, uh, to open the file, skip to uh, the location where uh, the, well, let's say that we have some sort of index, some sort of uh, information about the, the file saying how it's sorted, how it's organized, and that tells us that there's a set of uh, pages of the file that contain the uh, enterprise officer, the, the officers with the ship ID 1701A. Now, if you just use the uh, typical file system, uh, so you skip to the, the page that you're, you're looking for and read that page into memory, well, that's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to load that page into memory, and then now you have a bunch of data in memory, you process that data, you move to the next page, once again, you need to load that, sit there in memory, waiting for it to do stuff. Now at this point, the operating system might recognize, oh, hey, wait a minute, this person loaded two pages in sequence. Well, that probably means that there's more data in here that I can start reading. And, whoops. Uh, yeah. And so it'll load everything into memory. Now, of course, now, of course, that, uh, uh, ah, there we go, sequential read, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, that leads to a situation where it potentially loads too much into memory. The advantage of a, a database and a database specific paging scheme is that the database knows exactly what data it's looking for. So it can request the data, it can load all of the data into memory in one go, and read in precisely what it's looking for. And operating systems typically have some functionality that let, let you actually do this, as long as you know what data that you're looking for. Okay. So, um, that's kind of a high level uh, overview of the buffer manager. Yeah. Yeah, so you can actually tell the operating system what data to prefetch. Um, there's a function called mmap, uh, and there's kind of gimmicks that you can play to prefetch certain chunks of data into memory. Um, and the idea is that the buffer manager in a typical database knows how, th how to play these tricks, so operators sitting on top of it only need to say, I would like the following pages, and, or I would want, I, I would like the following ranges of, of records, or ranges of pages in this file, and the buffer manager kind of handles all of the details of keeping things in memory. Uh, now just to be clear, for the projects, the operating system virtual memory manager handles all of this adequately for, for you guys. Um, in a higher, uh, in, an, in a full database system, there's typically some layer that replaces that functionality with something a little more efficient. Okay, now, in order to do this, you need to actually know which pages correspond to which records. And in this example, I've been using I've been assuming that I have some sort of index that says, okay, this particular range of record, uh, this particular range of, uh, of pages holds the values that I'm interested in. Now, you know, this sounds great. How do we actually do that? Uh, do we have time? We have, we have some time. Okay, so uh, let's, take about two minutes uh, just to recap, bring this to the forefront, and just so that we have something on the board. Um, turn to your neighbors, uh, come up with a relational plan uh, for the following query, and we'll talk about, well, we'll draw that up on the board in about two minutes.
All right, it's not a super crazy query. Um, all right, What's, what is my relational algebra expression, or uh, more precisely, what does my query plan look like here? Who wants to start me off? All right, from the, let's start from the bottom. Hmm? Officers. Okay. What's sitting on top of that? Uh, sorry? All right, so I have a selection for... And then this weird condition on ship. Okay, uh, and then on top of that, rejection. All right, what's my working set size here? And what's my working set size here? One, it's constant. Uh, what about the time complexity? How long will it take me to perform this query relative to the size of officers? O of n. So I have to visit every single record in, uh, in O if I'm executing the query this way. <clears throat> so now we're getting a little into... Okay, so let's say that I had some ability to organize the data. How, what would make sense for this example? So, okay, so I could sort the data on what? I could sort it on rank. That's, that's a great suggestion. I could build an index on ship. I could even sort on ship. I could build an index on rank. I could build an index on ship. I could sort based on rank. I could sort based on ship. Um, and in general, kind of going back to, to basics here, the sort, the select is looking for some chunk of data, and we want to be able to organize the data in such a way that uh, we want to be able to organize the data so that we can get access to it. Now there's a couple of different strategies for organizing the data. We've talked about sorting. Uh, one of the other strategies is to simply partition it. So uh, let's go back to that query. Oh, got the query up there. Um, so if I'm looking for two specific ships, I could partition the data based on which ship the officer belonged to. And I could do this both for indexes and for uh, just organizing the data layout itself. Um, essentially build a hash table over the data or build a hash index. So at a really high level, uh, this might kind of get at your, your basic uh, high level indexing. Yeah. Uh, do time, yeah. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, so at a really high level, what we're trying to accomplish here is that if we have a selection predicate, we need to make sure that every single clause, every single conjunctive clause in that selection predicate is true. So if we can organize the data in such a way that we're guaranteed that there are certain um, pages of data for which the clause is guaranteed to be false, then we can just ignore those. We, we don't even bother loading those data, uh, that data in in the first place. Okay. So here is a question. 
let's say you have about 40, uh, excuse me, four gigabytes of data that's sorted on some attribute A, and you're looking for one specific value of A. How many IOs would you expect to need to perform? Hmm? Uh, why, uh, the answer was 20. Why do you say 20? Binary. Binary search. So I start in the middle, and then I partition it into two chunks of 2 to the 19th. And I recur into each of those. Each so you actually skipped ahead of, uh, skipped ahead of me here. Um, so if I have n blocks, I'm going to need log base two uh, thing, uh, log base two accesses to pick those up. Now, I mean, it, okay. So everyone here knows how to do binary search, um, but I want to illustrate kind of one view of that binary search process. Namely that if I want to do uh, a search for a specific value, um, I can break up the data into basically two chunks um, based on whatever value falls in the middle. And then I break that up into two chunks and I keep breaking things up into smaller and smaller chunks until I get to the value I'm looking for. The binary search does this recursive process, but as it's doing this recursive process, it's essentially following uh, a sort of binary tree over these uh, chunks. So this is kind of the insight behind one type of index called the tree index that you can store this binary tree or you, you can store the attributes in this binary tree uh, and that's going to allow us to get to the data that we're looking for much faster. Now here's a question. In binary search it takes log base 2 of n accesses to find the thing that you're looking for. Why base 2? because you're dividing the space into two. Now, that makes sense if every single access gets you precisely one comparison. <clears throat> However, there's kind of a, a weird catch once you start talking about file systems. Because when I'm working with a file system, my uh, granularity of access is the page, not the individual value. So if I'm doing n comparisons, I'm going to need n comparisons regardless, because a comparison gives me one bit of information. But if I'm doing an I.O. to load in a whole bunch of data, I might as well load in more than one record at a time. And that's the insight behind this data structure called an index structured access method or ISEM tree. <clears throat> and this is kind of the simplest bare bones type of tree index that you're likely to find. And the idea is that you have a bunch of leaf pages that are sorted on whatever key you're trying to sort on. And then on top of that, you build this uh, you build this tree structure where every tree consists of, uh, of some number of keys and pointers, where each pointer points to another page. And, yeah, okay. So in this example, the root page has this list of keys and pointers. Key and pointer zero basically says, uh, if you follow this pointer, you will get to all of the records that are less than key one. Pointer one is all of the records in between key one and key two. Pointer two is all the records in between uh, key two and key three, and so forth. And I can recur on this if I have more uh, partitions. 
Uh, let's. Yeah. You can illustrate this by actually constructing one. So the, the simplest way to construct an ISM index is, well, to start with all of the leaf pages, make sure that they're all sorted. Skipping something here. <clears throat> ah, right. So then you ensure that the data is all sorted. And then going left to right, you essentially build up trees, uh, you build up, up the non-leaf pages uh, in the tree. And I'm skipping over something here. Uh, we will go back to this on, on Monday. Accessing the data in here is uh, really pretty straightforward. Uh, you start at the root, you find the appropriate pointer that goes to the next page, then you use the, the keys in the, the page to find the next pointer, and you keep doing this until you get to the root. Um, if you're looking for a range of values, how much you go about that in this case, uh, using an ISM index? Right, so you find the subtree that corresponds to the set of records that you're looking for. Or more, more precisely, you find the, uh, the range of leaf pages that hold the records that you're looking for. Again, the leaf pages are all assumed to be sorted, so you, uh, in sorted order. So you find the first page that contains a record, and you just iterate over the pages until you find all of the records that you're looking for. Oh, excuse me. Okay, um, and this is where I'm going to stop for today. Yeah. Um, do all non-leaf nodes contain data as well as pointers? The non-leaf nodes contain keys, not data. Uh, the data lives exclusively in the, the, uh, the not... The data lives exclusively in the leaf nodes in an ISAM index. There are variations that... But <coughs> uh, keys. Sorry, uh, those are P's. Uh, P. Pointer. Uh, so key, uh, pointer zero uh, that says which... Sorry, page. Uh, Follow, go to this page to find all records less than key one, go to this page to find all records between K1 and K2, and so forth. Uh, typically, the, in this type of index, the data isn't stored uh, in the leaf pages, in the non -leaf. Uh, So the, the question is, is this uh, essentially a hash map? Uh, this is essentially a tree map because uh, a hash map, I need an exact value to do a lookup. Whereas here, if I want to find a value uh, k, uh, key 1.5, I don't need key 1.5, I just need to know that key 1.5 is between 1 and 2. And typically what will happen is that you load one of these pages into memory, you do a binary search over that page, and find the key that you're looking for, or the pointer you're, you're looking for, and then follow that. Yes, so you can essentially think K1 and K2 as being a range, defining a range. Uh, I mean, you don't actually... You don't actually store every individual value in the range, you, you store boundary points, and that's essentially what's happening here. Uh, the pointer for all values in that range, yes. Okay. Um, I'll put in... Excuse me? Uh, it's, uh, it's a tree, not a, a, not a cyclic graph. Okay, so the one thought I want to leave you guys with is... Does anyone see 
a potential for difficulty if I'm storing this kind of index structure over a sorted list? Uh, in the worst case, you might need to scan through the entire range for what? Or uh, could you speak up? Sorry. Okay, so I might need to scan through all of the records in a page. Uh, which is not necessarily computationally efficient, although now that we're dealing with disk, uh, now that we're dealing with disk, the really expensive thing is going to be loading things into memory from disk. So doing a binary search over uh, one page of data isn't necessarily going to be a huge cost compared to the cost of loading that page into memory in the first place. Uh, and in this case, I'm still only loading logarithm a logarithmic number of pages into memory, less if I'm doing caching, uh, intelligent caching here. What about, so how would I go about updating this index? Um, I could make another subtree. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Not change. In what if I wanted to insert a value? Yeah. Okay. So I'd have to um, I'd have to find some place to store this new data. One way to do that would be to start having pointers to other records. Oh, sorry, pointers to other leaf pages. Yeah? Uh, the tree is good only if we can bound the depth of the tree. Uh, yeah, so typically it's uh, if you build the leaf pages recursively going up, it's going to be log base whatever of n records or log base uh, however many keys and pointer key pointer pairs you can fit into one page um, so the depth of the tree is typically going to be reasonably small ah I see so if you insert a new value you need to rebalance the tree um, yeah and in fact the kind of default way of uh, so ISAM indexes are, well, it's actually worse than that because it's not just rebalancing the trees. Now you have to start putting data. Uh, uh, so the leaf pages, the assumption that we've been working with is that they're all one big sorted list of, uh, of data. So if I try and insert something into the middle there, well, now I have a problem because uh, I need to start moving a whole bunch of data around. Um, and one gimmicky thing to get around that would be to start including what are called overflow pages. But this just makes things really, really messy. Um, so this is basically meant to give you a starting point. And on Monday, we'll talk about uh, more efficient in, uh, tree-based index structures, and in particular, B-plus trees.